Yo, what's going on, people? It's your boy Ape Hancho, and this is Brits on Death Row. Brits on Death Row is a limited series where we take a look at some British nationals that are either currently on death row or potentially facing death row, have died on death row, or have had their death row sentence overturned. I've explained this in previous episodes, but if you didn't know, here in the UK, the death penalty or capital punishment was abolished in 1965, but remained for certain crimes such as treason all the way up until 1998. And seeing as the majority of these cases we're going to be taking a look at happened after 1998 that would only mean one thing the British nationals who will be taking a look at are either currently on death row or potentially facing death row have died on death row or have had their death row sentence overturned in foreign countries and today we'll be taking a look at the Kenny Ritchie case the British man who had his death row sentence overturned but ended up back in jail twice. Kenneth Thomas Ritchie, more known as Kenny Ritchie, was born on the 3rd of August 1964 in the Netherlands and although born in the Netherlands he would actually have dual UK and US citizenship as his father was from the United States of America and his mother was from Scotland. Not much is known about Kenny's early life and backstory leading up to his eventual death row sentence but what is known is that throughout his early years he lived with his brother Tom in Edinburgh but when his parents eventually split up they both went to relocate with their father in Ohio in 1982, meaning that Kenny spent 18 years of his life in the United Kingdom up until that point. The move to America was seen as a fresh start for Kenny, a new wild adventure full of fresh opportunities, but as you guys know, it would turn into a nightmare as the years proceeded. When touching down in America, Kenny would actually go on to serve in the military for a short while as a Marine, but after serving 14 months, he would go on to be kicked out after he and his sergeant had multiple arguments. After this, he ended up moving to the Old Farm Village apartment complex in Columbus Grove, Ohio. On the 15th of June, 1986, Candy Bar Shea would go on to move into the complex with her infant son, and on the first night, both Kenny and Candy would go on to have a sexual relationship with each other and very quickly became boyfriend and girlfriend. Now, their relationship lasted only a matter of days and within that time, things went left pretty quickly. The pair both liked to drink and as a result of this, Kenny was said to have had a short fuse so both him and Candy would get into arguments pretty much all the time. For whatever reason though, whether it be due to the drinking, arguing or another reason, only nine days later, on the 24th of June 1986, Kenny would learn that Candy had slept with a man by the name of John Butler. And once he found this out, he went to go and confront John and pulled a knife out on him. In response to this, it was reported that John, quote, bounced him around the room a little bit. And just after this little disturbance, Kenny would go on to punch the door out of anger, which resulted in him needing to use a splint. So the 29th of June 1986 comes around, and in roughly a week or so, Kenny is due to return to the United Kingdom. It's unclear if the return was to be permanent or not, but either way, the events that would start on the evening of the 29th of June would see Kenny Ritchie on death row for 21 years of his life. At around 12 p.m. on the 29th of June, Peggy Villarreal, another neighbour, was having a party. This party ran all the way through the evening up until the following morning. At this party, both Kenny and Candy attended, but this time Candy was with another man by the name of Mike Nichols. Candy told Kenny that Mike was a new boyfriend and would openly kiss him at the party. According to conflicting witness reports at the party, some say Kenny became angry at the fact that Candy had a new boyfriend, Whilst others said the three discussed the situation and Kenny accepted the fact that Candy had moved on and was now dating Mike. As a quick side note, in the years to come, both Candy and Mike would go on to get married but they would end up divorcing. Then, at around 1am on the 30th of June, Candy asks Mike to spend the night at her apartment, which he agrees and then the two leave. Now, before we get into what happens next, I just want to point out that Kenny denies any of this ever happening. So, roughly an hour later, the party was breaking up, and Hope Collins, another neighbour, would go on to say that Richie had asked her multiple times if he could spend the night on her sofa, but Hope would go on to say that she refused. Just so you guys are aware, Hope's apartment is the one directly above Candy's apartment, like you can see here in the picture. 20 minutes later, Peggy would go on to say that Richie offered to steal some flowers for her, 
from the greenhouse across the street, but Peggy told him not to bring her any. Between 3 and 3.30 a.m., Hope's boyfriend, Dennis Smith, arrives at Hope's address, and she wanted to go out with him to spend the night at his home. As she didn't have no one to watch her daughter, two-year-old Cynthia Collins, Hope says this is where Kenny offered to watch Cynthia, and she quoted Kenny as saying, well, I'll keep an eye on her in regards to Cynthia if you let me sleep on your couch. One of the neighbours would also later come out to say that he overheard Hope saying to Richie, go upstairs with Scooty, which was Cynthia's nickname. She's asleep, but don't lock the door. I can't get back in because I don't have a key. Then, at around 4.15am, neighbours would call emergency services as they reported a fire coming from Hope's apartment and that there was potentially people in there. But believe it or not, Richie was discovered outside of the apartment screaming that Cynthia was inside. It was reported that Richie was trying to get inside and he was very combative and interfered with efforts to fight the fire, but eventually two deputy sheriffs overpowered him and turned him over to police chief Thomas Miller to keep him out of the way. In regards to the fire though, it was said to have been that intense that firemen saw several feet of flames coming from the apartment and the deck curled up over the roof. One resident and the fireman both attempted to get into the apartment initially, but the heat and the fire was too intense to do so. In the end, several firemen had to gear up with oxygen masks and hoses to put the fire out, and Cynthia was then discovered to be inside, but unfortunately, she would go on to be pronounced dead at the scene. Her body was burning in the bedroom, but ultimately she died from asphyxia related to smoke inhalation. And so the investigation started to figure out what exactly happened to Cynthia Collins and how this fire had broken out. Was this a deliberate arson attack or was this just simply an accident caused by a series of unfortunate events? The local fire chief had arrived at the scene first and he had been called to Hope's apartment two times previously because things were setting fire mysteriously and they never got down to the cause of the fires. However, the investigation was soon taken over by the state fire marshal Robert Cryer because state law demanded that the state fire marshal's office investigate the scene of a fire when a life had been taken. After a brief investigation, Fire Marshal Cryer declared that the fire started, quote, accidentally, but it should be noted at a later date, he insisted that he never considered the fire an accidental occurrence, but again, it is thought initially it was quoted as being accidental. So after this brief inspection, Fire Marshal Cryer authorised the building owner to clear the apartment and within hours all the furniture was thrown into a lorry and taken to the local landfill. Now because of this request, this was one of the main reasons to back the claim that he said the fire was accidental because had it been a deliberate arson attack, the apartment would have been taped off and preserved for further investigation so the correct authorities could gather evidence. But 1986 was an election year and prosecutor Randall Basinger was one of several candidates hoping to be elected to fill the vacant position as a county judge. And so it was to Randall's benefit that he was to build a big case surrounding this incident because this was a big story for him to promote his name on the front page of the county newspaper and so he took charge of this case personally. After an investigation into the case, Kenny quickly became the suspect and he was arrested and charged with arson, aggravated murder, child endangerment and breaking and entering. Kenny had became the suspect after witnesses came forward to police, saying that he had threatened to burn down the complex building, of course, before it went up in flames. From the get-go, though, Kenny said that he was innocent of the charges and demanded that a lie detector test was put against him, but Prosecutor Bassinger refused. But before a trial was to go ahead, Kenny was actually given a plea deal where if he pled guilty to the charges that were brought against him, he would be eligible for parole after 11 years, but with this firm stance that he didn't start the fire, he never ended up agreeing to the plea deal. He would go on to say, quote, even if they offered me a year or six months, I still wouldn't have accepted it. Now, realistically, to be charged with what he was charged with and to be given parole after 11 years, on the grand scheme of things, it's pretty short, but again, he didn't accept this and so a trial was to go ahead. A trial went ahead on January 5th, 1987 and the facts of the case were stated as 
In the early hours of the 30th of June 1986, a fire had started in an upper flat in a Columbus Grove apartment building in Ohio. The flames rapidly spread, engulfing the living room, then the hallway before firemen extinguished the blaze. Minutes later, the body of a child carried out, confined in a room, she died of smoke inhalation. Hope Collins, the mother of the child, had left her flat after midnight, driving off with her boyfriend to spend the night at his house. It was well documented that Hope regularly left Cynthia unattended, sometimes even feeding her adult sleeping pills before doing so. The child welfare services contacted her on two previous occasions regarding her practices with Cynthia because she was reported by a neighbour, however, no action was taken. After the fire, she was threatened with arrest for neglecting Cynthia and therefore this meant that she was responsible for her death. This is where Hope claimed that she left a child in the care of Kenny Ritchie and made a statement about him offering to babysit for Cynthia. Although Kenny maintained that he did not agree to babysit Cynthia as he was too drunk from the party. Now, remember how Hope's boyfriend had actually came to pick her up from the apartment complex? Well, he was actually with one of his friends and both of them gave evidence in court where they both actually denied hearing Hope ask Kenny to watch her child or for any exchange between them in regards to watching Cynthia. A third witness who isn't named but was a resident of the building observed Hope getting into a boyfriend's truck from her bedroom window. Although she had nothing but roar from the truck's engine that awoke her, she observed Hope climbing into the truck, then saw Kenny, who was obviously drunk, stumble from the pavement and collapse into some bushes where he laid for 10 minutes. The witness became concerned and testified that she was about to leave her flat to check on Kenny's condition, but when Kenny finally got to his feet, he wobbled away from the view of the witness. This witness was the last person who saw Kenny before the fire had happened, and she doesn't know what happened after Kenny stumbled away from the bushes. When Hope Collins was told about the fire and the death of her child, she did not make any comment or ask police officers where the whereabouts of any babysitter was, which was strange because she would later come out to say that Kenny was caring for a child. Upon arriving at St. Rita's Medical Center in Lima, where Cynthia had been taken, Hope had told Dr. Thomas Dickey that Cynthia had previously set fires in her flat. Although this fact became known to the prosecutor, it was never mentioned during Kenny's trial. But the prosecutors put forward the case that Kenny had became angry with his ex-girlfriend Candy and her new boyfriend Mike, so he was going to set fire to the apartment above theirs, that being Hope's apartment, in the bids that it would go through the concrete floor and set Candy's apartment on fire. They said that Kenny had stole gasoline and paint thinner from a nearby greenhouse, which he brought to the scene of the crime by climbing onto the roof of a unit shed below Hope's living room room balcony. Once inside, the prosecution said he splashes gas and paint thinner throughout the living room and sets it alight before escaping back over the balcony with the empty cans. Witness accounts were given by Hope, Peggy and Candy, all which stuck to their stories which we've explained before. Candy would go on to explain how Kenny had became angry about her relationships after him and this would have been a motive to start the fire. Hope said that she asked him to be a babysitter which, like you guys know, would be backed up by a witness account from a neighbour but of course Kenny denies this. Peggy would be the one to say that after Candy and Mike had kissed at the party, Kenny had became angry at this and threatened to burn the building down. Again, multiple witnesses on the night of the fire claimed Kenny had stated at an earlier point that the building was going to be set on fire, again which we've previously spoken on. In more detail though, Jeffrey Kezar, who I believe lived in the apartment complex, testified he heard Richie saying, quote, If I can't have her, in regards to Candy, nobody else can. Robert Dannenberger, another resident, described Richie as being, quote, very upset and said that he had threatened to blow the place up since he had, quote, learned how to do explosives in the Marines. When Kenny allegedly said that he was going to set the buildings on fire, Peggy became upset at this and Richie told her, well, instead of blowing it up, I'll torch A section, which was a part of the complex building. Peggy also recalled Kenny saying, before the night is over, part of A building is going to burn down. There was about four other reported testimonies which came to the same conclusion that Kenny had said the building was going to go up in flames that night. According to a witness account from Mike Nichols, the man who kissed Candy at the party, he said that during the fire, Kenny told him, quote, why don't we finish it now since you think you're so bad and also threatened to kill him. Witnesses 
also claimed that Kenny looked over the fire damage. He drank beer, laughed and said, it looks like I've done a hell of a good job, don't it? Kenny would go on to admit that at some point earlier, he did steal two plants for Candy, which police would later find outside of Candy's apartment. And this shouldn't be confused for when the party was breaking up, Kenny asking Peggy if she wanted flowers. The plants that were outside Candy's apartments, though, were stolen from K&J Greenhouse, and the owner of K&J Greenhouse identified them as being stolen from there. On top of the plants being stolen, the owner also came out to confirm that paint thinner and petrol were kept in two unlocked storage sheds. He claims that both items could have been stolen from there, but he couldn't recall if any had actually been stolen or not. Now remember how the apartment had been ripped out and sent to a landfill? Well, on the afternoon of July 1st, the police would go on to recover the carpet from there. One piece of carpet was recovered from the top of a garbage pile, whilst another was partially covered in trash. Once recovered by police, the carpet was placed in the car park of the sheriff's office located no more than 40 feet away from some petrol pumps. It stayed there for three weeks before being taken to the state arson lab for testing. On the 17th of July, nearly three weeks later, a wood chip sample was removed from Hope's apartment. Of course, in both of these incidents, there was most definitely the possibility that contamination could have taken place. But after both pieces of evidence were looked at, it showed that accelerant was found in the wood chips from the deck floor and the carpet. This meant that even if the carpet had been contaminated, it didn't matter because of course, within the actual floor itself, accelerant had been used. What should be noted though, in Kenny's defense, no accelerant was ever found on his clothes and the clothes he had on by the time emergency services arrived were the same throughout the whole day. The defense said it would be near enough impossible for a person to use this much accelerant and not get a splash on their clothes. But it was heard in court that several mental health professionals concluded that Kenny suffered from borderline and antisocial personality disorders. Kenny's defense said at trial, this was ground for a death sentence not to be opposed on him. Evidence by psychiatrists and psychologists also revealed that he had attempted suicide on previous occasions before, which resulted in over 600 self-imposed scars and cuts on his body. The prosecution's medical experts came out to say that Kenny didn't suffer with any mental health conditions, and in fact had gone on to manipulate examinations by lying. Eventually though, after the trial had finished, Kenny would be found guilty on all charges brought against him, and he would be sentenced to death on top of consecutive prison terms. The death sentence came as a result of the aggravated murder charge, whilst the prison terms were for the other offences. No jury was ever present at the trial, and instead, three judges were present. It was actually his defence solicitor that pushed for the three judge panel rather than having a jury because Kenny's defence didn't think he would beat the case given the fact that a small child had died at the hands of this fire. So now Kenny Ritchie became prisoner 194764 and before we go through the large amount of appeals that would eventually go on to be declined, it should be noted that Kenny had been given 13 execution dates and on one occasion was only one hour away from execution and was asked how he would like to die. He said the guards would play mind games with him and even asked would you like the lethal injection or the electric chair with him responding neither because I'm innocent. In 1992 a direct appeal was lodged with Ohio's Supreme Court but was denied by four votes to three. In March of 1997 an appeal was lodged with the same judge who sentenced Kenny to death but that appeal was also rejected. In 1998, another appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court was also denied. Throughout the appeal process though, Kenny's defense tried to secure a re-examination of the forensic evidence that convicted him, but this was resisted by the prosecution. At one point, the prosecution that was now dealing with the case said, even though this new evidence may establish Mr. Ritchie's innocence, the Ohio and United States constitutions nonetheless allow him to be executed because the prosecution did not know that the scientific testimony offered at trial was false and unreliable. In 2000. Five after his new defence lawyers picked up the case though, they took it to the Sixth Circuit Court of Federal Appeals after they said that Kenny had poor representation in court. They argued that the state's case about the scientific evidence was flawed and some witness accounts about Kenny saying that he wanted to burn the apartment down had been retracted after they said the comments were taken out of context. 
In 2007, the court agreed with the appeal, and a trial was to be held within 90 days, or he was to be released. A massive campaign was also set up to fight for Kenny's freedom by multiple organisations, with a lot of celebrities coming out on Kenny's behalf. It was thought that at the time, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Tony Blair, and Pope John Paul II were amongst his supporters. In fact, the British government came outright and told the American authorities that they condemned the death sentence and it shouldn't go ahead. So a trial was to go ahead in October of 2007, which would have fell within the 90 day slot. Although on the 19th of December 2007, it was announced that Kenny had agreed a plea bargain and he would eventually go on to be freed after time served. Kenny pleaded no contest to involuntary manslaughter, child endangering and breaking and entering, the charges of arson and murder were dropped and Richie was released after being sentenced to time served. Part of the agreement was that Richie was to leave the US immediately. Judge Alan C. Travis, presiding judge. Thank you, please be seated. <clears throat> Okay, we have a plea to uh, certain charges. There would be a term with the amended specification. I will never have closure now that the outcome has changed. It will continue to haunt me the rest of my life. I just wish Cynthia could appeal her death and come back to life. Robert Collins, January 7th, 2008. Thank you. I have six pages here. I know I can't make it through it, but I want you to know you fooled nobody. Not me, not that baby, not any of these people. You will burn in hell. In the case, I think we're adjourned. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. Honor. Evidence that we're overruled, something like that, um, you might be able to appeal. <clears throat> I'd like to thank everyone who has supported me over the years, many years. Karen Tarley, my family, my attorneys, uh, who have always done an outstanding job, and many others who have campaigned and supported me over the years and have never doubted my innocence. It's great to finally be free at long last, and I'm looking forward to going home to Scotland. It's been a long time coming. Kenny, are there other innocent people on death row? There's at least 20 innocent people on Ohio's death row alone that I know of, personal. Is John Spurko one of them? John Spurko's one of them. Maurice Mason's another one. If you want to know the rest of them, investigate their cases, please. They are our innocent men on Ohio's death row. And so Kenny was to return to Scotland after spending more than 20 years on death row in America. When he touched down in Edinburgh, he said it felt good to be back home. But only six months after reaching back to the United Kingdom, he would see himself wrapped up in another case after he was charged with assaulting and robbing a 63-year-old man by the name of Robert McCall. The judge would go on to dismiss this case on the grounds that Kenny had already been through enough with his time spent on death row in America. Only a short time after this though, he returned to America once again, this time relocating to Mississippi. On the 31st of December 2011, he would go on to send Judge Randall Bassinger, who was the previous prosecutor in the death row case, a threatening message saying that he was coming to get him. In 2012, he would go on to be sentenced to three years in prison for this offence. In 2015, Kenny would get out of prison once again, and everything would go quiet for him. In 2017, he'd be back in the headlines after it was reported that he was involved in a housing project which was restoring houses for veterans. The first home was going to be completed within a few months. In a 2019 interview though, he was living in a tent with no job and no money because, in his own words, the man who brought him in on the project to help fix up the houses eventually stopped paying him 
and kicked him out. Although the person running the project told reporters that Kenny used to drink and argue all the time whilst refusing to find work. In 2020, Kenny was back in the headlines once again, this time for the same reasons in 2012, but this time he made four videos on Facebook vowing that he would end Randall Bassinger's life for taking his. His cousin seen the videos as a real threat towards the judge and she notified the authorities. In late 2020, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. But that was the Kenny Ritchie death row case, the British man who had his death row sentence overturned in America, but ended up back in jail twice. If you like this series, give the video a thumbs up. Let me know what you guys think of this down in the comment section below. And if you want the latest drill, street and music news out of the UK, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. If you want to see more episodes from this series, be sure to check for them on my channel. Spin your boy ape, Hancho, and I'm out.